Good morning, everybody. This is the last of the series, huh? I know, it's kind of a little sad, not, not too sad. <laughs> but I've been having fun, I hope you guys have fun. Um, so we've been doing the course on emotions. Today's uh, our last one, it's love and desire. We're taking next week off, and in two weeks, you all wanna be back here to hear Cliff again. Cliff is gonna talk on Revelations. Hot off his dissertation defense, so we'll have to call him Doc. Let me see him next. Hopefully. Yeah, no, hopefully it'll definitely happen. Anyway, because you're all gonna be praying for that, right, guys? Right there, you go. Remember that. Okay, nine o'clock on Thursday. All right, put that on your calendars. Okay, so the whole um, following Haddon Robinson's um, book on teaching and preaching. There's one big idea. Here's the big idea. If, if this is the only thing that anybody ever got from this course, this would be golden because this is what I've gotten from it, okay? Is that emotions are neither good nor bad, but they were created by God to be good, all right? We, we from our part of it, mess things up, all right? But if we can create a space, just a little bit of space, a little bit of room between that urge, that emotion, that feeling that you want to act and say something and actually acting or saying that something, if you can create a little space and in that space, ask yourself, is what I'm about to do gonna bring me closer to God or farther away from God? If we can create that space and, and have that thought, then we have done our job here, okay? Because usually you have an urge, an emotion, and then we, act on it, right? And more often than not, that the results of that action isn't always good. We just put that in there, you know? Um, for instance, am I helping this person or not? Am I, my urge to now respond to this person, is it gonna be for their benefit or for their detriment? Am I just, am I just letting something off? My, my, you, know, out of, you know, if I'm just, if it's for my benefit because I'm getting it off my chin, or off my chest, or is it for their benefit? And the answer to that question makes all the difference in how you want to continue. All right, so we talked last week about anger and kind of said, can anger ever be good? Can it ever draw us closer to God? And you're like, fine, yes it can, if it's righteous anger. Well, what's righteous anger? Well, usually when God defines what anger is, it's righteous. When we define what anger is, it's usually not, right? Because when we define it, it's usually self-seeking. When God defined, it's usually outwardly seeking, right? It's the same with love, right? We said, can love ever draw us away from God? Yeah, it can, all right? If love tends to be self-seeking, and we'll talk about that being more of a desire than actually love, okay? Uh, then it can draw us away from him. But if love is outwardly, we extending to him and to others, then it would tend to draw us uh, towards him. So a love and desire, the same thing. We'll get into that, all right? So for purposes of today, think of desire more of, although it is sometimes interchangeable, but desire is something that is for us, that we want to consume, and love is something that we extend to others. So is it the same thing? Well, it depends on who's doing the defining, okay? So let's get into definitions. We have uh, sorge or sorge or sorge, whatever. You, however, like you want to put a French twist to it or an Italian twist or, or sorge, which just makes it Americanized, which doesn't sound anywhere at least that good. Actually, I, I actually wanted to say this properly and I punched in sorge, you know, Google it, pronunciation, and I came up like five different ways that you could say it. So, um, I like sorge. I heard that sorge. So let's go with sorge. Anyway, that's affection. That is uh, like a parent's love for a child, or a child's love for parents. Very instinctual, uh, very reflexive. Um, then you have eros, which is um, sexual love. Now, interestingly enough, th that word gets tossed around a lot in the English language as love, but correct me if I'm wrong, Cliff, but I don't think that ever shows up in Scripture, does it? I can't remember it. I don't think it shows up in Scripture at all. In fact, when they're talking about sex, it's usually like, he knew her or he went to be with her, something like that, okay? It really doesn't say love, okay? Because that, that sexual act, I probably should put down sexual act 
instead of sexual love. Now, that, now we're more on the, we can often be more on the desire side of things, okay? Um, then, you know, in other words, what, and that's kind of a, a, a warped intent from what God wanted. For us, the, the sexual gratification is more of a drawing in, more of a desire. What, if you read through scripture, it's more of an external thing. You giving to someone, you caring more for the other person and their pleasure than your own. And then you have phlegio. Uh, brotherly love, friendship, we get the word Philadelphia, you know, the city of brotherly love, right? And uh, that's what we see here in John 5, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. That love that the Father loved, that's a brotherly love, that's a friendship love, that's a, a, a love that we exchange for one another. But here's the big one, agape, or agape, or I don't, I don't, Google it and get five different ways of saying it. But, it, yeah, great, fine, we'll go with that. But there's no R in it, though. So you can't, you can't even say that, Leo. That one doesn't work. Okay, uh, let's go with agape, because that's the one I've been saying more, all my whole life. Anyway, this is more of a divine love, a godly love, characteristics that it's inclusive. It reaches out to all. It initiates. It makes the first move. It's unconditional, and it's sacrificial, okay? So you know when um, Jesus is talking about love your neighbor, and the apostles go, well, who's our neighbor? And then what follows is Jesus tells the story of the, of the Good Samaritan. And if you remember that, the Samaritan, who is an enemy of the Jew, is hurt and beaten on the side of the road and was robbed, and these priests walk by, the religious ru rulers move by, and don't attend to him, and then, a Jew goes by, sees him, cares for him, brings him into the inn, pays for his, says whatever he needs, here it is. It's just a total stranger, okay? That's agape love, okay? That's the kind of unconditional, self-sacrificial love, and even to be given to a stranger, someone you don't even know, okay? That's what's being talked about here, that Jesus is talking, now it's a quote from Jesus, as the Father has loved me. Now think about the oneness that the Father and the Son, the divine, perfect Father-Son relationship have with one another. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Which is an amazing statement, okay, in and of itself, that Jesus is saying this amazing divine love that the Father and I have that's been for all of eternity, will always exist and never be broken, except by the cross, but that's kind of, we'll talk about it later, that that amazing love now I'm loving you that same way. That's incredible. But that's that agape love again. That's that divine, inclusive, initiative, unconditional and sacrificial type of love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in his love. Now this is very important because then we're not just talking about rules. It's not like an ultimatum. Okay, if you obey me, I'll love you. If you don't obey me, you won't love you. Okay, that's how our humanness sees this. But he's talking about it's kind of a result of that love, okay? Not a condition on that love. Because he's talking about you remain just as my I obey my father's commandments and I remain in his love. What that means is I have this relationship with my father that's never been broken. And because I love him so much, I, I, I obey his commandments. I, I want to do, and you'll see later, that, that what the, we're talking about here is just not obedience for sake of obedience. It comes out of a desire to obey. It comes out of a desire, a passion, that love that you have. That passion motivates you to obey, just as the love that Jesus has for his father motivates and drives him to obey his father because he wants to. Uh, and so that's what he's saying is if you have that passion in there inside of you for me, then you will obey what I say because you love me because it's going to be a result of that love, that, that obedience will be a result, not a condition of. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So you see that he's saying, okay, just not obey the rules and then this is a condition of love, but no, if you have that kind of zeal, that passion for me, that love for me, that desire for me, whatever word you want to use, there'll be a natural consequence of wanting to obey me as a result, and then you'll be happy. You have this complete joy 
That will be the response and, and the uh, result. My commandment is this, love each other as I have loved you. So now there's a progression. The father loves the son. They have this amazing kind of love exchange. He wants to pass that down to us. And he loves us that way, so we want to love him that way. And if that's a result, a natural consequence of that will be you love one another that way, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life down for one's friends, which again is amazing. That means you're going to love one another more than you love your own life. Just like that Jew who saw the, I mean the Samaritan who saw the Jew laying aside the road. I, I said the opposite before, but... I'm sorry. Okay, so the Samaritan, the enemy, sees the, the Jewish man on the side of the road and all the religious priests who pass by him and don't stop. The enemy stops, sees him, cares of them, and puts his agenda, his life, more important than his own. And he spends his money to make sure he's cared for whatever he was going, because he was going somewhere. He had somewhere to go, something to do. But he put that aside, his agenda for this other man who's hurt's agenda, and took care of him. And that was the sacrificial, unconditional, agape love. That's what we're talking about. Okay, now, so take that love, and let's look. I, I almost forgot to leave out 1 Corinthians 13. It's probably the one passage that I'm sure that everybody here has heard, and I almost forgot to include a slide on it. But uh, probably because you hear it so often, every single wedding you go to, right? Love is patient, love is kind, love is, does not, you know, all this stuff, it just rattles off. People could probably do it by memory, but they say it at every wedding, and we don't listen to it. And you know, and I, whenever I do a wedding, I, I make a point to say, no, if you pay attention to this, maybe you may want to back out now, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Seriously, uh, the door is there. Think this through because you're going to save money on attorney fees and everything else. Because <laughs> this is tough, really. Let's look at this definition of love, okay? Love is patient. I can do that for about five, ten minutes, but you know, okay, but in our minds, we think we can be patient. In fact, we believe we are patient, you know, just don't mess with my agenda, you know, but other than that, I can be patient. Love is kind. Sure, I can be kind, you know, at least I can talk myself into believing I'm kind, right? Love does not envy. Does not envy. Does not want what I can't have. Does not want what you have, all right? Do I want what my wife has? Um, no, until she has something I want, you know, or we have two different agendas, or she wants to go to a play and I want to go to a ball game, or something. Um, love does not boast. It's not proud. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I thought when things are going good, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud, I, and I, I boast. And it does not dishonor others. It doesn't throw them under the bus. It's not self-seeking. Okay, it does not easily anger. It keeps no records of wrong. Really? It, it does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. This is really tough stuff. Okay, now, when this is written, this is written in within, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, they're talking about spiritual gifts. And the thought, thought, discussion about the spiritual gifts is using them to support one another. And who's one another? The church, a community of faith. Okay? So this isn't just talking about wedding vows. Okay? It's a nice kind of poetic structure to it, and it goes well in a wedding. It's talking about our life together, all of us in this room, all of us in this church, all of us who are going to be in that sanctuary in a little while, all of us as part of this NEC community, all of us, all of us, all of us. The way we treat one another is this way. Really? Well, let's look at that Samaritan, right? He doesn't know this guy from anything, so he's got no records of wrong. Although, being a Samaritan, that guy being a Jew, he probably could have a whole lot of list of ways that his race and, and his country have been put down, have been shamed, have been discarded by people. So he probably had a lot of reasons to pass that guy by. He's got an agenda to go on, but he's not... He's not seeking his own. He just sees this stranger and puts his agenda, which is pretty apparent because the guy's bleeding all over the place and is beaten, ahead of his own. This is what God's saying. You've got to live out this definition of love, right, to a stranger, let alone the person you're married to. 
which doesn't happen. You know, when I do pre-marriage counseling, and I get to a point that uh, I, I remember having a couple one time that um, she insisted they don't fight because I want to talk about, you know, how do you fight? The, the way you argue, the way you fight is very important in how you're going to conduct a marriage. Oh, we don't fight. Oh, well, let's talk about when you do have a fight. We're not going to fight. You're never going to fight. We're never going to fight. You know, we just no. I don't see why we have to fight. We're just going to have a good godly marriage and we're not going to fight. I said, okay, we'll cover this later. <laughs> Within a few weeks, they're back. Okay, we're ready. <laughs> we, we had that fight. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to happen. Because why? Because we're not patient. We're not kind. We are envious. We boast all the time. We're proud as heck. We dishonor other people. We're self-seeking. We're angry easily. And we keep records of wrong. That's who we are. Let's face it. If we come to that conclusion, then guess what? You're going to depend on God to pull this off. You're going to depend on his grace, you're going to depend on others, you're going to lean on others, you're going to seek something other than yourself to pull this off. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to. And you go into marriage, you're going to have friends who are going to support you, you're going to have that buddy who's going to hit you in the back of the head and say, hey, smarten up, you, you know, you, you got you to obey this commitment you made to this woman and figure this stuff out instead of just walking away. You're going to do all this stuff and you're not going to stay within yourself to pull it off. All right? So I say to this couple, usually, in what, not this, this one couple, but any couple that I do pre-marriage counseling, I ask him first, why do you want to get married? And usually it's somewhere like, he makes me feel so special. She makes me feel so special. I just love being with her. I love being with him. And I say, okay, so what are you going to do when you can't stand being with him? When you absolutely cannot handle being with her? When it's not fun anymore? Because that will happen then what? That's when love really kicks in. That's when this really kicks in. And you, you better have someone or somebody to lean on because then it's not going to work any longer. All right, so when can desire hurt us? All right, when can we get into trouble? Well, from an overall concept, when we want something or someone more than we want God. When we desire something or someone more than we want God, okay? So let's take, since we're in marriage, let's talk about. So we have worries and concerns, all right? Those issues can create desires within us, within us that drive us away from God, all right? I have a buddy of mine who is a Christian counselor, and he had a fellow come in, and his marriage was on the rocks. And he said to him, I'll do anything to save my marriage. And my buddy said, do you really mean that? He goes, yes. He said, well, then it's not going to work. He goes, what do you mean? He said, because if you'll do anything, that means you're putting your marriage before God. And why would God ever create anything that would put a wedge between you and him? Think about that, all right? If you'll do anything, you've got to put God before the marriage so that ma God can work in you to help the marriage work. But if you put the marriage before, between you and God, it's just not going to work. Any worry, any concern you have, if you have that attitude, I'll do anything to X. Think about that. Do you mean anything? Do you really mean that? Do you mean anything? You mean anything that God tells you or leads you to or imparts on you or speaks to you? Yeah, that's one thing. But anything, anything that your emotions move in you, anything that thought, remember creating that little space between the, the emotion and the thought and then the action, okay? You got to think about this. Mark 4.19, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of others come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. With the desires for other things. Remember, this is from the parable that Jesus talked about, spreading the seed. Right? And seed goes on different soil. And seed goes on some of the soil right? that grows up within thorns and, and thistles and things of that nature, and they don't grow. And later on, Jesus explains that those thorns and the uh, thistles are worries of this life. What creates those worries? Well, desire for other things. We want things. We want agendas. We want stuff other than what God wants for us. And those create these worries and frustrations in us 
that will actually make us unfruitful, that we can't do something productive. In other words, we can't do what God is calling us to do because we desire things other than what God desires for us. Another thing that can hurt us, another way that desires can hurt us, it can make us want things that we can't have. From Deuteronomy, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his male or female servants, his ox or donkeys, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, sometimes we can read that and not really relate to it because we don't have ox and donkeys. I don't think we do, right? Nobody here has an ox and donkey. Um, some people still do, but we don't. Um, we don't have male or female servants. Actually, we might. We have a house cleaner that comes in, but I don't think we'd call her a servant. We pay her, you know. So we, you know, but understand what they're saying, all right? This man's household, what makes the house run, okay? So that ox and donkey might be like, we're going to go out and buy a John Deere riding mower after church today because I finally gave up on that one that I bought for like, a hundred bucks and try to keep fixing it up and I realized I probably spent fifteen hundred dollars in that thing fixing it up and it's time to get a new one right so I've coveted other people who have had brand new riding mowers so I'm gonna go out and get one right um, this is what they're talking about other people's lives other people's livelihoods other you know their fancy cars or whatever things that they have that you want that you can't have don't want it don't desire it because you start wanting what other people have and then feeling bad that you don't have it because you can't have it because you don't have the money or what, for whatever reason. That creates frustration and anger, and that desire will separate you from God. You know, I had this buddy of mine who talked about this land deal that he had where he lost thousands of dollars and he was so upset. I remember we were having breakfast together. And he was telling me about this land deal, and they found that there was some oil spillage because the land, there was actually a gas station on there that used to be, it used to be a gas station, and there was leakage and oilage, and now it's all up, and he's up and smoking, and he's lost thousands of dollars. I do. I thought you only threw like a thousand dollar deposit on it. He goes, yeah. Now, this guy is a land developer. A thousand bucks is like, you know, ten bucks to us, you know. So I said, I thought you said you lost thousands. Well, I could have made a hundred thousand dollars on that deal. Yeah, but you, what, what did you actually lose? What actually came out of your pocket? Well, yeah, I, I lost that $1,000 deposit, but I said, dude, you already were counting on the $100,000 that you already thought you were going to, that's not losing money, okay? That's not losing money, okay? Like, when you lose something, it's like that poor person who, you know, has next to nothing, and then they lose that next to nothing, or they, all they have is that little del jalopy car that gets them to work to barely pay the bill, and then that car won't work, and they lost that car, and then they lose their job. That's losing something, okay? It's just where his desire for something that he didn't have was so great, and even though this guy is pretty wealthy, he's all upset at losing $100,000 that he never had to begin with. Think of what a setup that is. You are so much setting yourself up for misery and a life of misery. So you, you're pretty well off financially, and you cannot be happy if you already want more that you can't have. It just it, it boggles the mind. It'll cause it to boggle my mind because I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank, you know. But think about all of us. All of us, no matter how much money you don't have, if we put ourselves on the scale of the world, what would we be? In a top uh, 80 percentile, 90 percentile? You know that little thing World Vision puts out that little poster that when we look around and say there's nothing in this house to eat, there's probably enough to feed a village in Africa for two weeks. Entire village. That's the truth. So we're at so much of a different scale, we can't even comprehend. Yet we look around and we just feel so envious that we're so poor because we don't have what we want. We can't have what that other person has. That's a real setup for misery. Okay, what else? When else? Well, when it's idolatry. What's idolatry? Very frankly, I guess all of this could be put on our idolatry, but when it's really clear it's something that we want more than we want God. Colossians 3, 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your early, uh, earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So the key is, what happens here is we desire something more than God, and we seek at it, and it actually pulls us away from God. And the irony in that, when that happens, 
the result is often guilt. And that guilt, like it did for Adam back in the garden when he went and tried to hide from God after he sinned, right? We do the same thing. Our inclination is to hide from God, right? Not to pursue him. We're the very thing, place we need to be when we find out that we have pulled ourselves away from him is to return back to him. I'll put it in simple terms. If we sin, the most important thing we should do is run back towards God. But because of that guilt ridness, we tend to want to hide and put on fig leaves and the moral equivalent of that. I remember early on when I came to Christ, when I developed a relationship with God, I was, I, well, okay, when I was in college, I really was probably high more than I was sober. I remember we would, my, my buddies and I would take three-day stints and not get high. And like, wow, this felt like a buzz because you know, we had such clarity of mind, you know. And, and, and I graduated cum laude. I imagine, wow, what could I have done if I was actually sober during my college career, right? Then in graduate school, though, it got a little tough. So I had to leave it for the weekend. You know, so the weekend, then I'd party and carry on. But during the week, I was pretty much sober because that material was a little bit harder. So when I came to Christ, I realized that whenever I got high, now, um, just so people know and for purpose of tape, I'm not getting political here. You know, I've actually have clients that now use medical marijuana very, very effectively to manage anxiety and other disorders. So I'm not going there. But I know for me, when I party, it was strictly recreational. And I had all kinds of desires. And it, it, it loosened up. It disinhibited me to an extent that, well, now that I knew that I had this important relationship with God to obtain, I was desiring a whole lot of things other than God, and getting high wasn't good. So I made a vow. I wasn't going to get high anymore. And that would last until Friday. <laughs> and then I got high. And I remember thinking, literally, oh my God, I blew it. I just, I wasn't going to do this, and I did it, and what can I do? And I don't deserve you, and I'm going to run away and hide. And, and God's speaking to me in the way that he does, kind of, nope. Let's pray. Let's pray. I'm high. This is like the last thing I feel like doing is praying. <laughs> but I'm going to force myself. There's nothing emotionally in me that feels like praying right now. But intellectually, somehow, at a very early stage in my journey with God, I realize if I, quote unquote, sin, move away from him, then the logical reversal of that is moving towards him. And you do that by praying. You do that by talking to him, right? When you have a fight with your wife, what do you got to do? You got to talk it through, right? Maybe you call time out, a little break, let the emotion subside. And then you got to talk it through. So God and I had to talk it through, okay? So we do. And guess who wins? <laughs> you know, God, right? But then, okay, good. Now I'm never going to get high again, right? And maybe now a couple weekends go by, and my buddy's like, come on, man, come on. Yeah, what, what, what one joint's not going to hurt me, right? Boom, I'm high again. Oh, no, I did it again. What do I do? Pray. No, I can't pray. I blew it twice now. No, pray. Okay, I pray. And this would go on and on and on. And every time I'm like, you know, this is, I feel like a hypocrite. I, you know, I feel like the worst, but it's like, okay. But the essence of sin is pulling away from God, so the remedy is always let's go and pray. But what I didn't realize what was happening, because it was happening gradually, is all these episodes of getting high became further and farther between. And the urges became less and less and less. And I remember quite a few years ago counseling to this guy. And the guy had this problem with marijuana. And he realized, you know, it's like a psychological addiction. I really need to get over it. So we were talking about it. And he asked me about me. And I, I shared a little bit about my struggles with it. And he goes, well, how long has it been since you got high? And I thought about it, thought about it, I go, wow, eight years, eight years. And immediately my memory went through those days when I was an early Christian struggling with it, like, is this ever going to leave me? Is it ever going to, you know? And I realized eight years of just, and what, what eight years was just every time I fell, just praying to God. Every time I fell, praying to God. Every time I prayed, and then he draw me back, draw, to a point where I don't want to get high. Now I can tell you now that's been, that was 30 years ago since the last time I had my last joint, okay? 30 years of, like, I have no desire to get high anymore, really, at all. But that's because, not because I don't desire a, a cigarette, but I desire God so much that at least that's one thing that doesn't get in our way. 
There are other things, you know. If I knew you better, I'd tell you, but, you know. <laughs> Doing God's work for selfish reasons. This is a big one. We kid ourselves that we're serving God and we're really serving ourselves. okay? And the funny thing is Jesus knew this was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen to you guys. He did. You know, not me. He knows I, I got it done, right? But he knows it's going to happen. This is what he says. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Really? I thought that was it. You declared Jesus as your Lord. You're in, right? But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Oh, well, then I'm safe. I do your will. I'm always thinking how to do more godly things. I'm really involved in the church. I do a whole lot of good stuff. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Prophesy? You mean there's people who prophesy in God's name? Now, by the way, prophecy really means speaking God's word. Okay? It doesn't mean telling the future. Some of the prophets got visions of the future from God and spoke that. So like sometimes in our culture, we think of prophecy as being future seeking. But no, it's really just speaking God's word. That's what it means here. So they spoke God's truth. Right? These people that Jesus is saying that, you, you know, that you're not getting into heaven, they spoke God's truth in the name. Didn't they drive out demons? They drove out demons in Jesus' name? And in your name perform my miracle, many miracles? What? They conducted me. Wait a minute. I thought this is like that's how you know when someone's a believer because they can drive out demons and perform miracles and say God's word, right? No, that's not how. We'll talk later about how you know that you are a believer. Jesus is going to respond to these people. I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. Wait, we didn't, we didn't really have a relationship. Yeah, you're going out there using my name and doing all this stuff and, and thinking that you were doing great things and all that. And maybe other people were even blessed by you. I had a friend who came to the Lord because he heard this uh, um, Christian comedian uh, speak, and it moved him and accepted God. And then many years later, this Christian comedian came out as a fake, and he was, had many wives, and he's fooling around on his wives while he was. In fact, he would give a, a, a this concert, you know, you know, comedy act, but uh, he was Christian and proclaiming the name of God, and then he was going across in a bar and picking up women right afterwards, you know. And all this came out. But guess what? My friend still loves God and still walking in the Lord. So he came to the Lord at one of those concerts, and his faith is still stuck, even though the guy who led him to it. I mean, God can use a donkey. Look it up in Scripture. It's there, right? He can use anybody or anything he wants. He can raise up the rocks, it says, to, to do this purpose, okay? I remember one time I was feeling frustrated because I felt my gifts weren't being used. And this has happened more than once, by the way, you know, because I don't know if you know this about, but I'm, I'm one of the greatest teachers that God has ever risen up. <laughs> See, you guys are laughing, and I don't know if that's a good thing. Are you laughing because you agree? <laughs> you know? And it's true, and in time to time, that other people get to teach when I don't, and other people get to preach when I don't, and, and it's, I, it boggles my mind. I don't get it. I'm, I'm like one of God's gifts to teaching and preaching, and how come I'm not being used more? So I have these little pity party prayers with God, which, by the way, pity parties aren't good, but if you're going to have them, do it in prayer with God, okay, because he's got a way of loving you, putting his arm around you, going, there, there, okay, now let's straighten your head, up. Let's, let's do some surgery on your brain, right? So this is one of these moments when um, I'm praying with God, and, and God says to me, okay, Greg, give me a vision of what you, you know, you're saying you're not being used, give me a vision of what you have in mind. And I said, you know, God, I, think, I, I see myself up on stage, I'm preaching your word, and I see hundreds of people coming and giving their life to you. Isn't that a good vision, God? And God goes, yeah, Greg, that's a very good vision. Now I got a vision for you. How about you go out in that audience, you're looking up and somebody else is on stage, and he's preaching my word, and hundreds of people come and give their life. Are you equally as happy? Whoa. <laughs> That's a tough test there, God. I should be, because it shouldn't be about me. If I truly am God's greatest gift of teaching, guess what? I should decrease that he would increase. It has nothing to do to me. Like God can use a donkey, right? That's why he can use me, <laughs> okay? Because I can be kind of thick-headed. 
It doesn't matter who's proclaiming the truth, it's that lies are coming to him. And if I truly love, I don't care who's doing the preaching, I love those people enough that I want them to know God, I want them to have that kind of relationship that I have, and I want it, it doesn't matter who does the preaching, whether it's me, or the guy up on the stage, or a donkey. Right? It doesn't matter. But if it does matter, and it needs to be me, then this applies to me. I'm not knowing God. Because if I know him and I'm in him, it doesn't matter. It only matters that people that I love, which is a stranger on the side of the road, anybody, is connected with the same God that I love. So, what should we desire? Well, scripture tells us what we should desire. Spiritual gifts are a good thing to desire. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of God, especially prophecy. And remember, again, prophecy, again, it's not fortune-telling. It is speaking God's truth, speaking God's wisdom, speaking God's truth into other people's lives. This is a very good thing to desire, okay? Now, the thing about spiritual gifts is it comes through the Holy Spirit. So we need to be connected to God to do that and to do it well, okay? And so this is part of it, okay? You're, you're praying here is, God, help me be connected to you that you can continue to use me with the gifts that you've given me, with the talents you've given me. What else should we desire? Well, we should desire to do the right thing. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This, this is actually a good memory verse, because the significance here is God, again, is, we've been saying over and over again, Doing the right thing isn't just obeying rules. You know, obeying commandments is not obeying, just obeying rules. It's, you know, the essence of sin is drawing away from God, not really rule breaking. So the remedy is drawing towards God, all right? And our obedience comes from our love from him. So therefore, we should hunger and thirst for what is right. We have this passion, this desire for it. In other words, God doesn't want us just to do the right thing. Because in the passage we read before, right, he said, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we perform miracles in the name? Didn't we do good stuff, Lord, in your name? Doing good stuff isn't enough. It has to come out from this passion that you have for your love and relationship for him and for one another, okay? Because that passion, in other words, it's not just important enough that you do the right thing. You've got to want to do the right thing. You've got to want it so much that it's part of the passion that you have inside of you, that you thirst and you hunger for it. The way that you thirst and you say, I'm really, really hungry. You know that feeling? Oh, I really need a drink of water, right? Cliff was just showing us Petra and he was telling us that it's so um, hot there that you got to bring tons of water because you'll run out of water. And guess what? It's 10 bucks to buy water there, right? Because they know when you have that thirst, you're going to pay 10 bucks for a glass of water, right? This is what he's saying. you got to have that kind of passion and desire to do the right thing. And that only comes from knowing God, from having that desire to be like Daddy. And this passion and desire for others to know God. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Now, I want to park on this a little bit. Because our passion and desire to see other people know God can easily become, I want those other people to be like me. You see how easily you can cross that line. This passion and desire that you love that stranger, you actually love that person, whoever it is who doesn't know God so much that you want them to know this amazing person that you know, as opposed to they're wrong, I'm right, I want them to be right because I want them to think like I do. That is night and day, two different thoughts. And one is going to bless God over here, and one is not going to bless God or that other person. Okay? So I'm going to share something that uh, Mike shared with us just the other night. A great verse that reminded us, i got to whiz through this real quick, but of, of what's being said here. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Okay? And now notice the progression here. We, you're praying, so now you're, you're alert and you're watching what's going on. Really, what you're asking for is that God would show you what's going on. And pray for us too, God, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Okay, that's what we're praying for. Well, we're paying attention for opportunities. Those open doors that are being talked about here are opportunities to share, not just going in like a bull in a china closet 
and sharing what people don't even want to hear, but looking for opportunities. Okay? Pray that I, and notice the word, how often the word prayer is in here, communication with God. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So you're speaking in a way that that person will understand. Not that you want to get something off your chest, but that they will understand. Be wise in the way you act towards others. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know, um, uh, that you may know how to answer everyone. In other words, you're asking God for grace, for wisdom, so that when you speak and they have objections, you're able to show it with grace and love, and that person is feeling cared for and sensing the love of God through what you're saying, not the opposite. I remember one time I was discipling this college student at, uh, who was attending our church, and he was so excited to see me one day, and he was telling me about this great debate that he had this guy, and this guy was an uh, active uh, um, atheist, and so they started this debate, and this guy had objection after objection, and he addressed objection after objection after objection. So then the guy tried to get away. He went to the campus center. I followed the campus center, and I go, and another thing, and I could nail every single thought. He was absolutely speechless, and he was so proud of himself. And I said, great. So he's coming to church on Sunday? And the guy looked at me like, no, of course not. The last thing he ever wants is to go to your, our church or any church and probably wants to have nothing to do with God after your little debate, right? Right. Well, so who were you pro proclaiming? Who were you helping? Certainly not God. He can care less, right? If he's God, he doesn't care about one of these little arguments. He's God. He doesn't care. All he cares about is that person who doesn't know him, he really wants to have a relation with him. And so he wants to use you, me, us, to connect him because he loves that person. And he wants to connect with that person. He's connecting with you, he hopes. But if you're just developing this idea, like, I want to win arguments, who, who benefits from that? Not that guy. Not God. Now you're being self-seeking. Now you're not being kind or generous or Okay, we should, what, we, what should we desire? Well, we should desire to be close to God. Now, this is Paul speaking. Listen to the quandary he has. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Think about it. If you had that attitude, if I die, great. If I live, great. Okay, why? Why can, why can either one be great? Living or dying doesn't matter anymore. Just think how important living or dying is to us. Right? If we live or die, that's a big deal, right? Paul's saying, no, it's no big deal to me. Well, why? What, are you psychotic? Well, not exactly. He says, if I, go to, uh, if I go on living in the body, you know, in the flesh, in this world, this means that I'll be fruitful, uh, the, will mean fruitful labor for me. Because I have this relationship with God, and he's going to help me to help others come to know that relationship, and that's going to be good. Yet, shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between two. I desire to be to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So his quandary is, you know, if I die, I get to be with Christ face to face, which is the ultimate. But if he lets me live, I get to experience him and share him with others, which is really pretty good too. So I'm in this quandary. Well, isn't that a great quandary? It's like, oh, that's a win-win quandary. I don't think he's psychotic. I think we are, right? Because he gets love. He gets love. That it's not just a desire for me and for, for good things and that I live forever. I'm like, I don't want to live forever. I really don't. I, what I want is what Paul has. That's what I want. That's what I desire. To have that attitude whether I live or die, either way is all right. Because if I die, I get to be with him. If I live, well, hopefully I get to be with him and share others about him. That, I, want, I want that. All right, wrapping up cognitive tools. I'd like to leave you with some cognitive tools, all right? So, again, getting back to the cognitive tools, the thoughts, right? That whole thing that when we have these impulses, when we have these desires, if we could create just a little bit of space to say a quick prayer, maybe even hopefully a reflexive prayer, God, what do I do? In other words, God, what brings me closer to you? What will bring me closer to that kind of joy? That doesn't matter if I live or die. Just imagine having that kind of joy, having that kind of certainty in God, 
And that certainty comes by having that kind of relationship now where you don't care about your own needs and your own pleasures or anything and stuff. They can have it. All I want is you, Lord. And because all I want is you, you're going to give me this amazing relationship with other people. I mean, you're going to give me this amazing marriage where we're both learning to be more like you. And we both don't care about our own desires. We only care about your desires and her desires. And he, she's caring about my desires, you know. You know, what, think about this. This is a little example that works for me. When you both look inward, right, like this, and you clash, this is what happens. But if you don't care about yourself and you're looking outward and you come together, this is what happens. You see? What? And that works in any relationship. If you put your own needs aside, you know, if somebody does something that really annoys you and it, your immediate thing, they annoy me, I got to repel them or I got to strike. Right? Fight or flight. Right? Flight, reflight, repel. I don't want anything to do with them. Or if you connect, it's going to be a fight. Think about that. Well, wait a minute. Is that putting my needs over that other person's needs? If I'm loving the way God wants me to love, why are they annoying? Why? What does that trait come from? Where does it come from? Does it come from insecurities they may have? Does it come from a past relationship that was broken? What is, what's in there? You know, if, if I do connect, should I not find that out? And learn how to connect rather than how to fight or repel or flight from that person. So here's some uh, memory verses to that end. And by the way, Augustine has this quote, love God and do as you please. Now think about that, right? Love God and do what you please. That means, okay, love, I'm going to love you here and I'm going to do what I please. But when I do what I please, I'm going to forget about you. No, you got to love God, which means you're totally immersed in him and his presence and what he's all about. And then if you do that, then do what you please, because what you're going to want to please do is to be self-sacrificial, giving and loving and have this unconditional love and put other people's needs ahead of your own. And yeah, do whatever you want if you love God, because you're always going to put the other person. And it doesn't matter if they're a believer or non-believer. You don't create this us and them attitude, just like the Samaritan helped the, the, the Jew on the side of the road. You help your enemy. It doesn't matter who they are or what color they are or you know, what the sexual preference is or any of that stuff. It doesn't matter. All you got to do is love them the way God loves you. Okay? Then you can do whatever you want. As long as you have that unconditional love for God that he has for you. If you keep, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, then do all the things that I've written in this book to tell you how to really love other people unconditionally, sacrificially, with you making the first move, not them, well, they don't love me, fine. Then that gives you more opportunity to be like God and love them when they don't love you. Psalm 48, 40 colon verse 8. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. There it is again. Remember we talked about heart in the very, very beginning. You do a word study on, on, on heart in the Bible and it talks about not that muscle that's pumping blood through your body. That's symbolic. It's symbolic of our passions, our desires, our will, okay, inside. That's where his commandments should be. His will, his law should be in there. We love him so much that his law reflects who he is so much that that's where it dwells. Not in the surface doing good things because we expect to do good things and get good things in return. No, the return, the reward is the fact that the law is in our hearts and our passion is so much for him that all we want to do is to love as an action towards other people. Even if they don't deserve it, even if they don't like us, we just love them because we are being more like God and our passion, our heart is for him. Isaiah 26, 8. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. That passion, that drive. Again, it isn't just enough to do the right thing. You're going to have to want it. You're going to have to have a passion to do the right thing. And some of it is a recognition that we don't do the right thing, that our nature is to be self-seeking. And if we know that, our passion or desires for God to change that in us. All right, to close, this is the mark of a Christian. Remember, they will know that you are Christians by your Bible verses they memorized. No, they will know that you're Christians because you're up there preaching. No, 
They will know you are Christians by your love. Okay? A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. How has he loved us? With this intense agape love. Unconditional, self-sacrificial. Initiative, inclusive, including all. That is godly, divine love. And that's the love that we are to show towards everyone else. 1 John 4, 10, and 11. This is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us. Who is the initiator? That is God. God was the initiator, even in our love, especially in our love relationship. He sought us out. He brought us to him. It wasn't the other way around. Lest we start thinking, oh, I got God. I figured it out. Now let me try to convince somebody else that, this is, that God is right. Understand, we were lost, except he called us. So he is calling someone else, and he's just using you. And if it's not you, he'll use someone else. It doesn't matter. But we have the honor to experience his love and to have others experience love, God's love from us. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The only time that God was separated from the Father was on that cross when he yelled out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay. Well, that was a rhetorical question. That was emoting. He knows why, because he had to experience that separation of God. He had to experience sin for us to be saved. And that was the amazing sacrifice that he was willing to make for us because he loved us and he wants our joy to be complete. So he gave up voluntarily what we do all the time without even thinking. Sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So next time we think that somebody owes us, that we keep a record of wrong, that there's something that somebody owes us and we're not going to do X until they do Y, okay? Think about a God who said, you owe me everything and you have no way of paying it back, so I'm going to do it for you. The love that I showed you now I want you to show everybody else. That's an amazing honor and impossible to pull off unless you have this relationship with him. But thank God, it's so easy. If we have a relationship and we walked away from him, we turn around and say, I'm sorry, and mean it. And he just pulls us back, right? Just like a child, any parent knows, all your kids got to do is look at you with those big, beautiful eyes and go, Daddy, Mommy, I'm so sorry. And, and you know they mean it, you melt. That's God every time. And that's a wonderful thing. It's so easy, yet so hard. All we gotta do is put down our ego, our pride, whatever we care about, whatever, we, whatever comes between us and him, just put it aside and just say, I love you and I'm sorry. Let's pray. Lord God, when we think about your love, it just, it's, it's just mind boggling. And it just seems so big and just amazing and impossible but yet it's so real Lord all that you sacrifice for us all that you have chosen to give to us and all you ask is that we do the same for other people Lord just teach us you know in our in our fallen ways you know how hard it is for us to do that but Lord in you all things are possible so teach us how to love change in us our desires change in us our hearts that we will love as you loved, Lord, and we will experience that joy that makes our lives complete and your joy complete as well. In thy name we pray. Amen. We got